this had an embedded federal courts question in it just in trying to secure review, which is how do you get review after a state Supreme Court has denied review of your case? So what happened was the Supreme Court of Texas has discretionary review. Now, we argued to the Texas Supreme Court that we met five of the six criteria for discretionary review, including that an intermediate court of appeals in Texas had held a federal law unconstitutional, which you would think would be something the Texas Supreme Court would want to to take a look at. But they denied review. And so what the United States Supreme Court has said is that, you know, a state cannot block the United States Supreme Court from ultimately being the final arbiter of federal law. I'm Alan Rosenstein, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 22nd, 2022. One of the last decisions that the Supreme Court handed down this year was Torres versus Texas Department of Public Safety. Leroy Torres, an Iraq War veteran and Texas state trooper, sued the state of Texas after he was denied an employment accommodation for injuries he sustained while on duty. The question in the case was whether the federal law that Torres sued under could subject states themselves to legal liability. In other words, as a constitutional matter, can Congress, when legislating under its war powers, limit the normal sovereign immunity that state governments enjoy? This is an important question not just for veterans who want to vindicate their rights, but also more broadly, because Congress's war powers are some of the broadest and most consequential that the federal government possesses. I talked through these issues with Andrew Tutt, a lawyer at the law firm of Arnold and Porter, and who argued and won the case on behalf of Torres before the Supreme Court. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 22nd. Andrew Tutt on the Torres case, state sovereign immunity, and Congress's war powers. So, Andrew, let's just start with the background facts. Who is Leroy Torres, and why was he suing the Texas Department of Public Safety? Yeah, so Leroy uh, was a officer in the Texas Department of Public Safety, and he was also an Army reservist. And during the time that he was employed, he was actually uh, deployed by the U.S. military to Iraq, where his lungs were sort of damaged by the burn pits on the military base at which he was stationed. And when he returned, he informed his employer that he could no longer carry out the normal duties of his previous job, but that he thought that he could be reassigned to a, to another job that would accommodate his his sort of lung injury. And the Department of Public Safety declined. And so uh, Mr. Torres sued under the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, which we call USERA as the shorthand. That act guarantees every person who in the United States that they won't be discriminated against by their employer on the basis of their military service or a service-connected injury. And so he sued because Texas had sort of declined to make an accommodation that the law required them to make. Let's talk a little bit about USERA. As a practical matter, how important is this law for veterans? I mean, are we talking about a fairly minor provision that is used sometimes, or is this one of the main ways that the United States ensures that veterans are protected in the workplace, and in particular with respect to any injuries that they may have sustained while fighting for the United States? This is, yeah, this is one of the primary ways that the United States protects its service members, reservists, and and returning veterans. Because as you can imagine, the incentives when someone comes back from war with a really significant disability is, you know, that you'd rather not have to figure out a way to sort of reemploy them. And even when someone goes goes off to serve the, the United States and comes back many years later, you don't want to give them back, you know, the incentives are not there to give them back their same position at like level of seniority that they would have had had they not served. So the law is extremely protective and it protects sort of everyone who is deployed overseas who also works for a private employer. So it's, 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 it's extraordinarily important, the, the law. How, how is it generally enforced? You know, what, what are the sort of the causes of, of action or the, the remedies that it provides? Because it, you know, it, it, it was enacted in 1994, and here we are more than 25 years later, and this was a case of, of you know, first impression, which we'll get to in, in, in a bit. So I'm just, you know, in, in the 25 years, we've had pl- plenty of wars and plenty of veterans since then. Um, how, how have people enforced it? So 
you know, most people work for employers who are actually subject to the full panoply of USERRA's remedies. And, you know, the main way that it's in, enforced really is voluntary compliance, thankfully. I mean, most employers uh, sort of understand the sacrifice that service members are making and and do go to great efforts to accommodate veterans. But if they fail to do so, uh, there's a there's a private cause of action in the statute that individuals can use to sort of vindicate their rights. So you can bring a, a lawsuit against your employer. And that's really the primary uh, vehicle. The other way that you can enforce you, Sarah, is you can actually make a complaint to the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor can then investigate, talk to the employer. Often those are resolved consensually, but then if necessary, it can make a recommendation that the Department of Justice uh, institute a, a case instead. So in previous cases where someone has brought a or has sued the employer, it, has the issue just been that these have been suits against private employers? And so the issue of sovereign immunity hasn't hasn't come up? I, I guess what I'm trying to ask in a somewhat roundabout way is is why it took more than 25 years for for this this kind of case to, to come up. Well, so and this and this gets into something, you know, USERA in its modern form goes back to 1994. That's when it was codified and named USERA. But, um, you know, the roots of the law go back much, much further. You know, it's been around for a long time. And Congress has been very attentive to the law. And one thing that they did was that they amended the law in the late 1990s after the Supreme Court decided Seminole Tribe, a case about the very issue, or at least related to the issue that was at issue in this case. And what they did was they put all actions against state employers. So people were bringing actions against their state employers in federal courts. And in fact, almost every federal court had ruled that states could not assert 11th Amendment immunity against suits under the pre-existing laws up until Seminole Tribe. So there was actually a, a big, robust body of law that said that what they ultimately confirmed in Torres was correct, that you could sue a state. But Seminole Tribe made Congress think that perhaps now the cause of action was at risk. And so they amended you, Sarah, to say that you could sue in state courts so states would not assert sovereign immunity uh, under the 11th Amendment. And these cases began to be litigated in state courts. And actually, there have been many, many cases brought in state court over the last 25 years. Um, it's just that state court is in many ways less visible. Then the other unfortunate thing was that no one was really succeeding in their suits in state court. So you would you would take the case up and the, the state Supreme Court would say that Alden versus Maine, another case that's in this case, had sort of barred the actions in state court as well. So you, you mentioned some of the sovereign immunity cases, Seminole Tribe, Alden v. Maine. Let's take a moment and step back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you an unfair question. And it's unfair because I teach this stuff to my law students and I can't answer this question. But maybe you can. Can you just explain sovereign immunity? Can you just provide the, 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 the two-minute uh, guide for the perplexed? You know, what, it, what is sovereign immunity? And in particular, how does it differ with respect to suits brought in state courts versus federal courts, which, as we'll talk about, is one of the issues that the dissent talks about in its opinion. That is that is a huge challenge. I'll say that the most basic thing that you can say about sovereign immunity is, is just the principle that a person may not sue a state without the state's consent. That is That is fundamentally what sovereign immunity is. And just practically, it means that in most situations, most of the time, if you want to sue a state, you basically can't unless there's some specific provision that has outlined exactly the parameters under which the state will allow you to sue it. And this principle even, you know, applies within states, suing cities and municipalities, for instance, under state law. Also, there's the, the principle filters down. But that, in a nutshell, is the only thing I think that everyone agrees is sovereign immunity. Anything else I could say about sovereign immunity is contested in the both in the courts and in the scholarly literature. But I can tell you that it is the principle that you can't sue without the state's permission. 
that was a marvelous elevator <laughs> pitch description of of sovereign of sovereign immunity. I, I knew you'd come through. <laughs> As a general matter, you know, does sovereign immunity distinguish between suits against a state in its own court or its own court system versus suits against a state in the federal courts? Or are those equally, you know, quote unquote, offensive to the dignity of the states for those who are really into sovereign immunity? Well, so already we've gotten into a hot, hot, contested topic. Um, There are three views. One view is that states have sort of less, they have junior varsity immunity in their own courts, but big immunity in federal court. One view says that they're the same, which is the prevailing view of the United States Supreme Court that sort of at least with respect to federal law, they're the same. And then one says that they actually have varsity, I guess I would say, uh, sovereign immunity in their own courts, and then kind of a junior varsity immunity in federal court. So, I mean, those are all the possible views, but those are the three, those are the three views. And, you know, it came up in, in our case and, uh, you know, it was asked, was there, is there a difference between, uh, the fact that this was in state court or federal court and, you know, the party line is, uh, that there is no difference. And that is, that is what the Supreme Court has consistently said. So as you point out, this happened in state court. uh, And correct me if I'm wrong, but the procedural posture is this was in Texas state court. It got to the intermediate level, at which point the Texas court said, you can't sue, sovereign immunity. And then uh, Mr. Torres, your team, right, uh, petitioned for a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court and and got it. So so that's correct. Let me ask you, because this does strike me as quite unusual. Um, I'm not used to seeing petitions of the writ of, you know, petitions for a writ of certiorari to an intermediate state court. So why did it occur this way? You know, why wasn't this argued up to the Texas Supreme Court? And and why do you think that the the Supreme Court granted your petition, especially given that the um, Solicitor General actually recommended against the grant. I mean, I, it seems like you you over you overcame a bunch of obstacles to get this even heard by the Supreme Court, and I'm really curious why why you think you were successful in that regard. Sure. Well, I answer the first question first, and and then try to answer the second question. You know, the the question of um, you know, this is the case if you really love Fed courts, this is the case for you. And and who doesn't really? Right. I mean, if you don't, you should. I had the I had the the privilege of having the greatest federal courts professor teaching uh, Judith Resnick. So if she's listening, and you know this had an embedded federal courts question in it, just in trying to secure review, which is how do you get review after a state supreme court has denied review of your case? So what happened was the Supreme Court of Texas has discretionary review now. We argued to the Texas Supreme Court that we met five of the six criteria for discretionary review, including that a court, an intermediate court of appeals in Texas had held a federal law unconstitutional, which you would think would be something the Texas Supreme Court would want to to take a look at. But um, but they denied review. And so what the United States Supreme Court has said sort of over many years as an interpretation of its jurisdiction is that, you know, a state cannot block the United States Supreme Court from ultimately being the final arbiter of federal law or federal questions. So if you exhaust and a court that had the chance to take review doesn't, once you've done that, you may petition the U.S. Supreme Court. So we asked Texas, Texas said no. So then we asked the U.S. Supreme Court. I will tell you, usually the U.S. Supreme Court, I think, takes a takes a sort of a, a cue from the higher court of the state and says, like, well, if it's not important enough for the Texas Supreme Court, I'm not sure it's important enough for us. But in this case, they obviously they 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 took a different they took a different tack, you know. So we did have the case does not feature many of the things that people who regularly practice before the Supreme Court think of as as things that you want a case to have if you're thinking that you want to get the Supreme Court to take review. So there was no conflict among courts. They were all in agreement that you could not sue. We were coming from a state intermediate appellate court 
uh, which is not generally the signal that the court is looking for, that the case is worthy of certiorari. And then uh, the United States federal government was invited to weigh in and said that it was not a good case to decide the question presented. But the court did take the case. And, you know, I, I checked, I read the opinion and it said that they took the case to decide the question presented. I don't know. Usually they say something like, oh, because this presents an important question of federal law on which the courts are in conflict, we granted certiorari or something like that. But, you know, all that the court told us was that um, was that they granted because they wanted to resolve the constitutionality of this statute. To be fair, you know, that is a big deal. And and, and to be clear, it was not, at least for the court, a particularly simple case. I think it was one of the last, one of the very last opinions to be issued. It was a 5-4. So, you know, the, the Texas was wrong and Solicitor General was wrong. You, you, you picked a good case to litigate. Well done. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the the case itself is just kind of a case about like fundamental questions about kind of what we what we owe to the people who go and fight and die to protect us. So wh- whether it was a, a good case for these purposes, you know, it was it was definitely our privilege to get to be a part of it and try and and try and win it for Captain Torres. And I was just glad that that we were able to. So let, let's talk about the opinion itself. I, I, I'm curious to hear what your theory of the case was going into the briefing and the argument and to what extent that is ultimately what the majority opinion written by Justice Breyer, to what extent the majority had adopted that? Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we had a theory that the Constitution's sort of the the evidence that you have at your disposal when interpreting the Constitution all pointed to the conclusion that in these circumstances, the federal government had the power to sort of make a state answer a lawsuit, even if the state didn't give its permission. So that, you know, at the end of the day is what the case is about is can you, can you overcome state sovereign immunity? Does the state not get to say, no, you can't sue me in these circumstances? And, you know, can it block these suits? And, you know, we, we started at the most basic place, which is the text of the Constitution, you know. And I I do think that the court started in the same place. So it talks about how the provisions of the Constitution that talk about war powers is not a single sentence or or something vague. It actually appears in interlineated, uh, you know, interwoven provisions in the Article One and Article Two. I mean, provision is made throughout the Constitution for special circumstances related to war, et cetera. And it has specific clauses divesting states of their ability to interfere with the executions of the nation's sort of war powers. So at the so we started with the text and we thought that the text was kind of the fundamental fulcrum on which the case turned. And I do think that the t- that the opinion reflects a lot of that, which is interesting, especially because, you know, Justice Breyer is. He's not the one who loves the text the most on the on the Supreme Court, but yet it's a very textual interpretation of the Constitution. So and that was our that was our primary theory. But at the end of the day, when you look at the text, when you look at what war powers are for and about, and you add up all the evidence, you sort of I mean, our fundamental submission was at argument. You can hear it in the argument the the states could not have read the Constitution and thought that they would be able to assert sovereign immunity in this area. The question almost becomes like, does anybody really think that they thought that they would be able to stop the federal government from allowing its soldiers to sue if they were interfering with the execution of the war effort? So I, I, I want to dig into that argument in, in a couple of different respects. The, the first, and this is maybe just a, a clarifying question, under your theory in which abrogation of state sovereign immunity comes from what's sometimes called the plan of the convention rather than let's say from a necessarily from an act of Congress though, you know, here you have potentially both. Is it necessary for Congress to actually clearly abrogate state sovereign immunity? So in, in, in the dissent, and we'll get to that in a little bit, one of the arguments that justice Thomas makes though, justice Breyer kind of dispatches with it pretty quickly is that here USERA itself as a matter of statutory interpretation does not explicitly abrogate state sovereign immunity. 
Justice Breyer says that's not actually true. He points to a bunch of, pa of, of pages. But it does seem that under your theory, where the states, you know, under the original constitution understood just looking at all the parts that talk about the federal war powers and the lack of state war powers, that they did not have any sovereign immunity. And under, their, under that circumstances, do they simply just not have any sovereign immunity? Or does Congress still need to, as part of the exercise of its war power, explicitly abrogate state sovereign immunity? That, that was something when I read the opinion, I, 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 was, I was confused about. And I'm curious what, what your thoughts are. Well, you know, I will tell you, that is an incredibly difficult question. I'm glad that it wasn't presented by the case. I do think that under any sort of view of what the Constitution requires, USERA does enough. And we could talk about why that that is. It is the kind of theoretical question on which I was told at moot courts not to opine during argument. So, you know, maybe that's just a little bit of that is coming through now. Unfortunately, here you are talking to a law professor. So my, my apologies. That's, that's all we do. There, let me say this. There are cross-cutting constitutional principles that might mean that you still need a specific focused attention by Congress to permit a suit against the states, even if it doesn't arise out of the same sort of formal principles that govern abrogation. So, you know, for the for the listeners who are not as nerdy on this as we are, if Congress wants to authorize a lawsuit against a state under the conventional rule, they have to say very, very explicitly, you may sue state X. And Alan, I hear you asking me, but if they have no immunity at all, why wouldn't they just be like everybody else and like stand on the same footing as like ordinary Joe citizen. And you wouldn't need a special, very focused statute. But if you look at things like national league of cities or Gregory versus Ashcroft, these are these, this is me using shorthand for constitutional cases, but there are cases that the Supreme court has decided that say that states are different. And I don't think anybody disagrees with, with that. And they need to be treated with respect irrespective of whether it's about suing them or not. I mean, certainly in the context of lawsuits, I think that the Supreme Court has been very clear that they need to be treated with a lot of respect to protect their sort of individual autonomy as states. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm not going to give a bottom line opinion because, you know, that case could arise and then I don't want to be crosswise with what I said. But it, it, it is an interesting and difficult question of constitutional interpretation you know, how do you regulate a state as a state? And if you incidentally sweep in the states as part of some other regulation, are they just like everybody else? So the, the other question I wanted to ask about your argument, the majority's opinion, is it does strike me that suits brought under or pursuant to the war powers, to Congress's or to the federal government's war powers, are the best case for your argument because for both a variety of textual reasons and practical reasons, war powers and foreign relations generally is where the federal government's interest is highest, where the need for federal uniformity is highest, or federal supremacy, perhaps better said, is, is highest. Are there other provisions or are other subject areas, you think, where a, a, a similar argument could be made to this level of certainty and where these kinds of issues come up, right? You know, perhaps bankruptcy. I mean, there are other cases like this, but I'm just, I'm curious, where would you rank, in other words, states being subject to suit under the war powers versus under other provisions of the constitution? Or is this the kind of best case for your argument? Well, I do think that this is the the best case for, well, how do I want to say it? I think that the, the, the war powers are probably the most uniquely national power of the powers conferred on the federal government from my perspective with a bunch of related powers, right? Like the treaty power, the other foreign relations powers sort of right up there, you know, the group, they call them in throughout the cases, you know, I had the, the opportunity to read quite a lot of Supreme court cases starting in 1790 and going through today. And this shorthand for the great national powers of war, peace, and treaty making are referenced as sort of a phrase that appears and reappears over centuries in the Supreme Court cases. 
And, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, there is the, there are cases that say things about the commercial regulatory powers being just as important or, or of equally high importance. But I think as far as, as I'm concerned, where I draw the line is the foreign relations powers, the looking out where, where we are not 50 states, but one nation, that is where the states sort of lose their ability to assert sovereign prerogatives. They may have other, there may be other limitations, and this was quite a feature of argument, but their sovereign prerogative is really a feature of our internal organization of our of our nation. Now, I have to tell you, you want to talk about like the most dis, like contested areas of like law and constitutional interpretation. This is just one man's perspective on this, but that that is how I that is how I I draw the line. And I you know, and I was asked to argument this, you know, if you just rejiggered the argument in Seminole Tribe to a plan of the convention argument, could you? Just, you know, because Seminole Tribe went off on formally a different legal theory. You know, my answer is no. I think Seminole Tribe is about ultimately a a set of powers that are domestic, not international, and so don't have the same implications. So I, I will admit, I, I find your position and I find the majority's position pretty conclusive. And yet this was a 5-4 decision, um, one of the last decisions of the term, which presumably meant that you know, and the justices were thinking pretty hard about this. You know, as uh, as Justice Brennan, uh, I don't know if this is true or apocryphal, but even if it's apocryphal, it's one of those, uh, as they say, too good to check. As he used to tell his clerks, the most important, the most important thing in the Supreme Court is being able to count to five. You 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 got to five, and and that's all that matters ultimately. I, I am curious, what do you make of Justice Thomas's argument and the fact that it wasn't just Justice Thomas who. You don't have to agree or disagree, but I, I will say this from my end, sometimes has somewhat idiosyncratic solo opinions or idiosyncratic Thomas plus Alito opinions. He got uh, Justices Gorsuch and Barrett on board. You know, they clearly were willing to issue an opinion that would, practically speaking, impede a, actually a very important way that the United States ensures military readiness and takes care of its its veterans, despite as you point out, it being pretty clear that one of the most important federal powers and honestly one of the main reasons why we scrapped the Articles of Confederation and rewrote the Constitution you know, back, back in the late 18th century was because of a lack of a strong national foreign policy and, and military apparatus. What, what do you make of their argument and, and uh, you know, what, what is your most charitable reading of where they're coming from in the dissent? I think the, the dissent is very persuasive. I mean, I think the majority opinion is more persuasive personally but but the dissenting uh, opinion by justice thomas i think is 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 quite powerful and raises you know really sincere issues you know i mean one thing that he points out is that they had built a substantial body of precedent a constitutional precedent on sort of a framework understanding of the constitution that the majority was in some sense not overturning but cutting into with rationales that, that, you know, I think he makes a good point, like could be seen to undercut some of those earlier, the foundation of some of those earlier opinions. And of course, you know, that is sort of the first step toward precedent, sort of an entire sort of area of precedent starting to unravel is when you're starting to decide cases that are undermining sort of the fundamental precepts of earlier cases. Now we insisted that was not how we we were framing up the case, but uh, it comes through in the majority opinion a little bit more clearly that they they apply a test ultimately that does have tension with the rationale of Seminole Tribe, and so you know I do think obviously like that's very important. You know they are a constitutional court, and like people make decisions, Congress legislates, builds whole you know frameworks around that. So I thought that was very persuasive. I also thought going to the exact same point, those earlier cases are decided on a very, on a rationale about the constitution that I don't think is necessarily crazy, which is you start from the, the, the framework of everything not explicitly granted to the federal government is reserved. And if you have that like framework, and I think there's lots of reasons to have that framework as a default rule, then you can't authorized suits against the states because that was just never given. That was just never conferred. 
and sort of, I think that he makes, he makes a good point. I mean, I think more, it's, he's speaking more about precedent, but he does talk about sort of that fundamental premise, which underlies those early cases. I thought it was interesting. Nobody, I don't know anybody who sees this area of laws as easy. <laughs> the answer as like obvious in his dissent in a, in a case called union gas, justice Scalia. I mean, I almost wanted to cite this to the court says like, I don't think the answer to this question is clear, but I think the better view is that the states have sort of an absolute sovereign immunity. And so, you know, I thought that was that was interesting. You know, he did do that sometimes in his opinions and sort of show his hand where it wasn't not everything was absolutely certain. He's like, you know, I don't I don't think that this is obviously my way, but I I think it's not your way. So I do, I, I find the dissent quite, quite compelling. I mean, but the, I do think the majority for various reasons having to do with sort of adding up all of the evidence available comes to the right result. I mean, it's just about taking all that evidence and trying to figure out ultimately what does this, what does this document mean and how was it designed to structure the nation? And so, you know, I hold with the majority, but you know, even Justice Kagan is only she's she concurred separately to say, you know, I'm kind of in both camps, <laughs> but I'll join the majority. That and and that's actually my my next question. You know, you you point out right that Justice Thomas is concerned with precedent, and you're too polite to say it, but I will say I do find that slightly ironic given uh, his frequent statements that arguments based on precedent are the weakest form of arguments, but you know, I'm sure there's a, there's some nuances there and, and your, your, I think very graceful admission that this is not a completely obvious case, right? So you can imagine, you know, good arguments on, on both sides. Um, and that does, I think, bring me to, I think, an interesting question. And I think one that is at least suggested by Justice Kagan's concurrence, which is what do we make of the law of sovereign immunity post Torres? Or to put it a different way, does this case bring clarity to this body of law or does it make it that much more complicated? I mean, obviously we know that with at least respect to USERA or maybe even more broadly with respect to statutes that are passed pursuant to Congress's war powers. Okay, now we kind of know the answer. But as Justice Kagan wrote in her concurrence with what I thought was a nice bit of understatement, um, she writes, our sovereign immunity decisions have not followed a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no kidding. Uh, and again, as, as someone who tries to teach this to law students, I'm, I'm not convinced does a good job of it at all. I can I can vouch for the uh, total lack of straight lines in this doctrine. Um, I mean, is 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 sovereign immunity doctrine clearer or or less clear after Torres? And and to be clear, if it's less clear, that doesn't mean that Torres was wrongly decided. It might just mean that you know we now have to go to the to the previous cases and fix them up in light of this case. But I'm, I'm curious sort of what, what you make of the, the, the state of the law for all the, all the treatise writers and hapless law professors. I mean, I think that among the, the, this is again, just my opinion, but I think among the trio of, of exceptions cases, this is the one that does the least to muddy up sovereign immunity. So in some sense, I'm telling you, there's nothing to see here. Torres is, is just going to be anybody. I get the feeling that people will look at the exceptions and they'll be like, oh, so they must have started with the war powers. And then they started to say like, oh, bankruptcy too, not not bankruptcy and eminent domain and then the war powers. It's a weird order, certainly. And, you know, and, you know, I think Justice Breyer says a constitutional scheme that allows it for bankruptcy and um, and eminent domain, but not war powers would be not entirely clear to say the least or something like that. You know, there is a, there's a certain constitutional coherence to at least making sure that the war powers are up there with the other two. So does it, you know, does it unsettle, you know, whenever you acknowledge the possibility of an exception, somebody is going to try and say like, well, I fit that exception too. So like, you know, and they did, I'm sure that that was top of mind when they were thinking about this case and they were like, oh gosh, if we say it for the war powers, it's gonna, we're gonna get so many petitions about, you know, name your statute. But I think it doesn't upset the fundamental framework that they set, the line that they drew in Seminole Tribe, which was that you cannot just casually allow people to sue states 
as sort of like just part of your general sort of regulatory powers. You know, it was a line in the sand that said you don't regulate states, especially not with lawsuits, the same way that you regulate everybody else. And Congress has really been uh, respectful of that. Now, you know, one could say Congress is already made up of representatives of the states, so it can be respectful of that without having to to have sort of judicial doctrine. But I think a lot of people are going to, they may try, but to, they'll struggle to compare their case to Torres and say, oh, yes, well, you know, like the war powers, the power to coin money is a unique power for which, you know, the Constitution was created. You know, it just, it doesn't roll off the tongue quite the same way. And so I actually think it, it's kind of neutral on whether it, it does anything to sort of upset this area of law. That, that, that's interesting. Maybe we just don't share the same intuition, but it does actually strike me that uh, it's kind of hard to imagine what exact case would come out of the coin money stuff. Um, but actually, if a state tries to start coining its own federal, its own national currency, it actually doesn't strike me as crazy that the, the arguments for for abrogating state sovereign immunity uh, would would be strong. But but I, I I take your point. What did James Madison think about cryptocurrency? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> that that'd be quite a good student note. Um, <laughs> I, so I want I want to finish our conversation by zooming out a little bit and asking you some some of the questions, kind of perhaps on the periphery, but I think are still worth asking. The first is going back to you, Sarah, and, and to the policy issue, right? Not the Fed courts issue necessarily, but the policy issue here about protecting veterans. Do you think that it, Torres goes a long way to sort of comprehensively settling the main issues around state enforcement of federal veterans law? Or do you think there are other legal impediments that will have to be litigated in the short to medium term to make sure that veterans, many of whom are employed by states, right, that are enormous employers, especially in the public safety fields, that their rights under USERA are are vindicated. So after Torres, they can sue the state. That's great. But are, are there other roadblocks that that we need to deal with? Or or was this the real the real sticking point? And 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 this is now kind of the the, the big issue that has gone away. You know, I I wish I was knowledgeable enough to to really give you a comprehensive answer. I do know that this was a major roadblock and I also know that USERA makes a lot of provision for saying things like there shall be no, you know, administrative exhaustion prior to instituting suit. Sort of it will be the scheme by which these rights are secured. And so I think it it does remove a substantial a substantial barrier. I mean, but you know, it's so hard to anticipate. I hate to, I hate to like prognosticate, you know, whenever one legal defense goes down, you know, something, something inevitably arises. So, but this was a huge barrier. I mean, there were suits in, in Florida at the Florida Supreme Court pending when Torres was decided, you know, many, many lawsuits across numerous states where people had been turned away on the basis of just state sovereign immunity. That was it. You know, the first day in court, the the state said we invoke sovereign immunity and the court said dismissed. And so that very basic threshold barrier to holding state employers accountable is just no longer going to be a barrier. The other question that I wanted to ask was what, if anything, Torres has to say about the substantive scope of Congress's war powers. So what what I mean by that is after Torres, it seems pretty clear that where there is some dispute between the federal government and the states with respect to war powers, the federal government's interest is very strong, and that even the quote unquote dignity interests of the states are are not powerful enough to overcome that federal interest. And one can imagine that coming up in different contexts. But the question of what the substantive scope of Congress's war powers seems somewhat different, right? One could imagine that the, the the powers are very strong where they exist with respect to the states, but they're not that wide. And I'm curious if if you think that Torres can plausibly or will be used by litigants, perhaps even by the federal government, to argue that for structural or historical or other reasons, war powers should be interpreted broadly just as a grant of power to the federal government, irrespective of its relation to state interests? Or if you think those are just, those are just different, and that's just, Taurus is just not about that. It's just about the state, the, the federal-state conflict where it comes up. 
Well, as you know, the, the Supreme Court does not opine about the scope of Congress's war powers very often. And so, you know, when it does do that, that case reverberates certainly through executive branch lawyering for a lot of propositions that you and I read in the opinion. And we just think like, well, that's just like throat clearing before they get to the main issue. And those are going to be important statements for uh, executive branch lawyers going forward. So, you know, I think the opinion endorses the broad and sweeping statement about the the war powers from United States versus O'Brien. And so like that, I would fully expect will now, instead of having to go all the way back to 1968 for that proposition, you will see that the they'll be like the Supreme Court of the United States only recently reaffirmed that these powers are broad and sweeping. And, and then you'll see, yeah, I think some arguments by analogy. I mean, it was never really said so frankly, but that the, the part of the case was sovereign immunity is very, very important, but the war powers are very, very important to and that's like our argument. And, you know, I mean, at one point, Justice Barrett said, you know, a big part of their argument is that isn't sovereign immunity small potatoes compared to some of the other things that the states were divested of in this area of law. And you can certainly see a flavor of that from the opinion. And so I would not be surprised if executive branch lawyers, again, working, working because they are the primary, a, a group that primarily works with war powers issues were to make those kinds of comparisons and say, like, if the war powers are capable of of sort of displacing state sovereign immunity, then we think they can be used to do this. And of course, it's just a background assumption of the case that authorizing a cause of action for money damages is part of the war powers, that it's that it's a, a core part of the Raise and Support Armies clauses. So there's lots of things in there that you might see play an important role in analyzing, yeah, the breadth and depth of, of the war powers. Um, now I would say, you know, fully consistent with what the war powers are, their breadth and depth, others might, others might disagree. Well, I think, uh, this is a good place to leave it. Uh, Andrew, congratulations on the victory and thank you for coming on and walking us through this complicated, but very interesting. And, uh, for both immediate and long-term reasons, very important case. Thanks for having me on. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com, and you can also buy Lawfare swag at thelawfarestore.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.